Hello, and welcome back to day two of Dreamforce, where we're again live from the NYSE studio that we've built just outside the Moscone Center. We're unpacking everything that's going on. And again, if you know Salesforce and you know where it came from with Sales Cloud being one of the biggest things, you know that pricing and getting quotes out can sometimes be a hassle. But that's what we're going to dig into is how do you take away that complexity and really understand how to get something out with CPQ. You, if you know what you're talking about, you know what CPQ is, and we're going to dig a little bit deeper in here. We have Chris Schutz, who's the co-founder and CEO of Logic.io, and he's going to help us unpack this. Welcome on board, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So I, I think one of the things is you've been around this industry for a while. I've, I've been a consumer of this uh, mm -hmm. multiple times, yep, yep. Uh, and I know the complexity that goes into this. Kind of help us understand how CPU Q market has evolved over the last 20 years or so. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Rob. And I think one of the challenges, it really hasn't. So it, it, CPQ has been around for a while, you know, configure price quote. It's a really big business problem. You know, generally companies that have more complex products and services, it's a bigger, bigger problem and harder to solve, you know, especially in tech and business services and software manufacturing. Those are kind of key verticals for CPQ. But the problem is a lot of the solutions in the market have been these monoliths that have sort of evolved in the early 2000s. My previous company, Big Machines, is one of those solutions, which was uh, which has a good share of the market. Um, and the problem is that modern selling has really changed a lot. So if you look at the way, like you know, you consume products, I consume products. We have very high expectations from a as a consumer, and those expectations are starting to to actually move into the way we interact with business applications. And so what that means is, you know, the old days of a CPQ app being, you know, challenging UI, slow performance, not composable, no AI, you know, those those drawbacks are becoming more and more prevalent, um, you know, as, as the market moves forward. And that's one of the reasons why we started Logic.io. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense in the fact that, again, the complexity of selling has somewhat increased, somewhat simplified, but it's different routes to market and things of that nature, which really trying to build out a, you know, configure price quote tool and get it, you know, lined up for yourself has to be a challenge. So how is AI playing a role in this these days? Yeah, that, that it's interesting. And I think AI is a gold mine for CPQ. And, uh, and so we look at it in two big buckets. So one is how do you make it easier for the salesperson with AI? And how do you make it easier for the admin that has to maintain CPQ day to day with AI? In the in the salesperson bucket, um, one of the things we're doing at Logic IO is we have a technology we call Smart Predict. And if you think about a sales rep, let's say direct sales rep, maybe you sell uh, X-ray machines to hospitals, so there might be like 200 options on an X-ray machine. If you're a sales rep and you start answering those questions in Logic IO, the AI engine will see where you're headed and it will automatically recommend the other 150 answers. Now, for a lot of cases, if you get like a late stage deal and the quote's gotta be absolutely accurate, you'll go back and you'll look at what the AI engine did and maybe make some changes. But where Smart Predict is really interesting is if you think about top of funnel, where you have lots of deals with low probability, you want your reps to be able to cover as many deals as they can very quickly. And so Smart Predict could do, you know, where a rep might handle 100 quotes a day, now they can maybe do 500 with AI, which is which is really interesting piece of it. The other thing we've done is we've made it so that you can take uh, and have a conversation with the configurator, which is actually what sales reps like to do when they're on the road or when they're you know, getting a coffee or whatever, they can actually talk to the configurator and say, create a proposal for an X-ray machine for me for Hospital A in Lancaster. And they have you know 220 volts, they have a 20 by 20 room, they have this amount of lead shielding send me back the sales bill of material. And then what Logic IO does is it'll run using our large language models and actually send the quote line items and pricing back to the rep automatically. So it's a really cool like productivity piece. Um, the other thing with Smart Predict that's really interesting is we do a lot of deals where using our composability, customers put our configuration in their CPQ tool like Salesforce, right. which is a lot of our deals. But they also take the same CPQ rules engine and they put it in e-commerce experience. So if you think about that, you can maintain your rules in one place 
and you can sell direct or um, you can do self-service uh, on the internet or you can use the configurator as a lead gen tool. So a lot of our customers buy our tech because they want to put their configurator online and use it as lead gen. And so it's just like if you go out and buy like a new car, the first thing you do is you, you, go, you go online for the manufacturer and you configure the Mercedes or whatever before you even step foot into a dealer. Well, a lot of B2B buyers are doing that now with technology and our configurator allows them to put, they can put it on their corporate website and actually do that self-discovery. And Smart Predict actually helps a lot with that too. Is, is this so. kind of that whole composability aspect of it where, yeah, I mean, because when I look at it, you know, people, like you said, there's different routes to market. There's different uh, ways that you want to entice people into your product set, be it, you know, B to C or B to B or what have you. Mm -hmm. Is this where composability comes in and how, how the different, I guess you could see, features of the product set are exposed? Yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's why it's so important. And that's part of that new buyer persona that's that's emerging from our B2C buying behavior into B2B. We do a lot of B2C stuff too, but B2B is primarily a lot of these complex transactions. And what the buyers want to do is they want to do it on their terms on their channel. And a lot of these deals will actually cross through several different channels to get them done. So like we have a customer, Keysight Technologies, here in the Bay Area, really cool Fortune 1000 high-tech manufacturer, and they bought our tech because they sell very high-end diagnostic equipment, oscilloscopes, they have a huge defense business, and a lot of their buyers actually want to go online and do discovery, and so they do that on their website. That becomes a configuration in Logic I.O., and then behind the scenes, we send that into their inside sales team, which is a different channel, and then they follow up with the customer and get the deal done, and composability is critical for that. You know, so we have customers that put it into like service scenarios in addition to e-commerce and CPQ. And that's that's a huge value prop for us. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that a lot of people have gotten used to the instant gratification that, the you know, the Amazons and, uh, you know, all of the different marketplaces have brought. Have you seen that be really a focal point for your customers saying, hey, this is what I'm trying to do is give them that B2C type experience in the B2B world because they're, they're expecting it now. They want to be able to do their discovery on their own. They want to be able to do this. And oh, by the way, it shortcuts it for my SDRs and my ISRs and the sales reps that I have out there. Yeah, e exactly. And, and one of the key things you need to be able to do that is you need to have amazing performance. So what I tell a lot of customers and prospects, if Amazon took you, took three seconds to give you an answer, we would probably all stop using Amazon to buy things, right? And so one of, the cre one of the key factors is performance. And so when we started Logic IO, we knew we had to figure out the performance problem because that has been a key Achilles heel of most, actually all CPQ tools you know, to date. So it's situations where you hear stories about reps waiting like five seconds, 10 seconds. And you're like, well, it's only five seconds, but if I'm a rep and I have to update the page 25 times to get a deal done. It's a very frustrating experience. And if you start talking about this concept of digital self-discovery and self-service, then wait times are just a complete non-starter. And so we put a lot of uh, R&D into our rules engine. So there's no update button. There's no save button. There's no, uh, you know, spinning wheel while you're waiting for it to calculate. We, you know, you could have thousands of options, thousands of rules. And the big thing with Logic IO is it still behaves like Amazon. You can ask it very complex questions and it'll get back to you. And what I tell a lot of prospects, it's actually like a video game, the way you interact with it. And you're like, well, that's cool. And people like that, but it actually changes the buying behavior. Yeah. So if you have, un, you know, if you have unbelievable like video game, like performance, it actually changes the way people think about your products and they'll actually make a lot more selections and a lot more discovery which then gets them closer to doing a deal with you long-term. So it actually has tremendous value from a long-term like conversion standpoint. So I, I, I think, you know, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that, again, one of my experiences with CPQ was that we tried out several different CPQs. And what we found was that we, the first one we tried, it was like we were going to have to go spend a million dollars in configuration with a consultancy and try to try to get it up and running. We went to another one. It didn't really, you know, fit our size company. We were a small company at the time, you know, 5,000 customers and things of that nature. How do you see 
customers because it's it seems like you've focused like you talked about the getting rid of the monolithic legacy type stuff where you've been before how do you really help them get started what's the time to value that they can expect how does it tie into salesforce for that matter yeah yeah it's a good question actually in 5000 customers sounds like a pretty good business to me <laughs> it, so, it was good business so. they got acquired so oh, okay <laughs> not okay, not a bad good. thing <laughs> um yeah and the other benefit of composability is you don't have to do like a million dollar 12 month project and what i find is that especially here in the bay area a lot of tech companies they just don't do one year projects anymore like we, um, I'm giving a talk today with um, a really cool tech company, Fortune 1000 company, and their CIO, you know, we signed with them and their CIO said, we're doing a three month project. And everyone's like, that's not possible. And they're like, nope, give me something in three months. And we did it, which we love. We love customers that like to go fast. That's awesome. But what's cool about composability is you can still just use the technology where you need it to solve your business problem versus like, do a complete rip out of this gigantic, you know, concrete monolith, you know, so to speak. And so a lot of customers like it if they have like a bunch of products, but there's only one product that's really hard to sell. Sometimes we just do a configurator for that and it's like a one month, two month project. And then we do like a lot of um, uh, deals with Salesforce where it's a complete, you know, re-engineering of the front end of their business. And those are longer projects. But um, what I'm finding is companies now like to just use it where they need it. And then they like to do these these sprints. So now this company I mentioned did a three month project. They've done three more three month projects to to really transform their business. And now they're doing another project right now that's that's um, led by the CEO himself. And it's just a really it's a lot more fun. Yeah. To so, do projects like yeah, that. getting bite sized chunks, seeing success, continuing on because I, I, again you know we we had uh, and I owned the product at the time and we had all so I was responsible for you know basically the SKU list that was going into CPQ and you started to look at it and we were evolving our business as rapidly as we were getting CPQ put in and we were bringing on new partners where we had another set of you know SKUs that had to go to the partner uh, what we found was that you know I mean the, the value of CPQ is we we actually pivoted and started with the partner led one because we were getting more value and what they found is that it we could get the quotes out faster than they could. So it, what was you know we weren't adding time to their quoting because it would go through the channel. Do you see these multi-level channels and ways to market as pretty normal with the the clients you're working with today? Yeah, yeah, we do. We see it a lot, um, and it it is somewhat uh, aligned by vertical, as you'd as you'd expect. So a lot of tech businesses like. They'll have a multi-tier channel with VARs, distributors, resellers, and they all interact with each other. And that adds a ton of typically like workflow and pricing complexity, which can be a challenge. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, the easiest use case from an adoption standpoint is a company that just has direct sales because they can just aggregate the team, figure it out, do the design, take it to, you know, take it to market. Um, and then we work with, you know, manufacturing companies where it's all distribution and then when you get into some of like the off highway or um, you know automotive stuff, then you get dealers, which is kind of a whole different experience. And in those cases, you kind of create like these little retail sites for them, you know, because um, some of these dealers can be quite large businesses, and they'll actually take the composability. They'll put our configurator in their website, which is also kind of a cool a cool benefit for them. So. Have, have you seen people like in the marketplaces actually? trying to build in CPQ into their the marketplace experience as well? Yeah, a little bit. It's not super highly adopted, but we're actually getting more and more like marketplace type inquiries. Um, so I, I'm not, honestly, I'm not really sure what's going on with that because yeah. it seems like everything's made like a full, a full 360 because that was back in 2000 when we actually started my previous CPQ company. We actually started it as a marketplace configuration engine and then all the marketplaces kind of fizzled, you know, if you remember in early 2000, yeah. but it seems like maybe they're making a comeback, so. I think they are, yeah. I, I think they are. I think there's a lot going on in various different industries where the marketplaces are consolidated. And I think a lot of that has to do with being able to do comparisons and people looking and, you know, quickly trying to evaluate. Uh, I, I think, again, that's where, you know, recommendations and other stuff that come come in. So how, how do you see your customers? Uh, 
you know, how do they recommend you or is that how you get a lot of your business is, you know, through those recommendations and things of that nature or is, you know, where do they just come find you at Dreamforce or how, how do you see this? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we do get customer recommendations. We we're very aggressive with customer success. So we take a lot of NPS scores constantly. Our NPS is 54, yeah. which actually is quite good that for enterprise good. Yeah. software. I think it's a little bit above Salesforce, but below Apple. So we're, we're very proud of that. Um, and uh, so we and we actually allow customers to give us NPS scores anytime inside the app. And those all get circulated to our management team. And then every week we look through all those scores and anyone that's a detractor, I personally reach out to them and find out what we can do to, to make them a promoter. Um, so that is a good bit of referral, but obviously Dreamforce is huge for us, you know, so we'll get, you know, we have two, actually two booths here this year and we invest a lot in the Salesforce relationship. Um, it's, you know, it's a huge part of our, huge part of our business. So we do shows. Um, we also do a lot of outbounding into these, into these various verticals because, you know, the way we look at the market is if you don't follow this trend in buying behavior, you know, where, where B2B buying customers want to do it on their time, you know, and they right. want to do it their way. We feel like a lot of companies are going to get marginalized. Totally agree. So, so what are you looking forward to this week at Dreamforce? Uh, looking forward to Friday. Yeah. <laughs> we, I think we all are. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I want to welcome you on board and, you know, thanks for coming on today. I think, again, Chris, uh, this is... Uh, you know, I'm passionate about this myself because I've been on the other side of it. Yeah, and yeah. I think you can see that simplifying it. And I think it definitely your point on AI. Uh, this is a place where I would expect AI to could help massively, especially up leveling some of those salespeople so that they can be more accurate, quicker, more efficient. So good yeah. stuff. Yeah, AI is a goldmine for the for the users and the admins that have to maintain these these systems day in and day out. So we're really excited. Thanks yeah. for your time, Rob. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah. And thank you for watching this episode from Dreamforce, where we're headquartered out at the NYSE's offices. We'll be back with more, so stay tuned, and we'll be right back.